I'm your host, Marsha Florence, for Just Dance Podcast Live. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me, as usual. I look forward to seeing each and every one of you, whether it's through Podcast Live, Just Dance Talk Show on the web, or if it's Twitter, Facebook, anything that we can get the information over to you, I appreciate you joining us. Whether you send me a direct email, a text message, you know, and a lot of phone calls. So thank you, as usual. And uh, as I always say, you know, we're here for you, the public. And what that means is that there is a question someone has for me or wants to know about a resource, and we like to get that over to you as best as we can and as often. So once in a while, you will see me do a show by myself, is to say, to answer questions that uh, some viewers have called in to ask, and we think it's good to share amongst the, the viewers of the public so that you all can have the same answers about some services that you didn't know exist or know little about. Well, today's show is very dear to my heart because this person here uh, comes back and joins us, you know, periodically. But every time this gentleman comes, it's always with some great, wonderful resources that we can use. And at this point in our lives, mental illness is affecting us all. Regardless if you want to say it's not you, it's someone you know, someone in the family. And we need to address it more. A lot of times we don't think we understand a person say, oh, they're just irritable, they're just tired or, tired or something. But actually, it may be something going on in their lives, and we need to be more informed on what resources are out there that we can use. So today, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to my returning wonderful guest, Executive Director Kevin Fisher of NAMI. Good afternoon, Kevin Fisher. Good afternoon, Marsha. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. And thank you for joining me as usual. I always appreciate you coming. It is always my pleasure. Thank you. Good. Now, you know, Kevin, I, I, I said NAMI, and a lot of people may not know what NAMI is. So you want to give them the, the, the true name of the acronym I gave out? I will. NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. We're the nation's largest grassroots mental health advocacy organization purely dedicated to building better lives for the millions of Americans affected by mental illness. Okay, okay. So as usual, Kevin, when you come to see us, you know, it's always some great information. A lot of people, you know, they miss sometimes. They want to say, oh, okay, you're going to play that show back again. Well, they don't know. They can always go back to Facebook and, you know, repeat it. But when you come in brand new on, on a subject, we like to hear from you directly. So today's topic I know is normally what we talk about. Is mental illness, but we got some added additional information on into that. But I wanted to start off with uh, my favorite logo here from you, Everybody Versus Stigma. So, you know, Kevin, you, you guys have a, a T-shirt with this on here, don't you? We do. You know, uh, my wife and I uh, copyrighted the brand Everybody Versus Stigma. Um, it supports a foundation uh, we established, the Dominic Fisher Memorial Foundation. Uh, of course, um, you know, I lost my son, Dominique, to suicide in 2010 after a three-year battle with serious mental illness. So that's how this all started for us. But what we recognize is across the board, literally across the world, stigma is the leading barrier that prevents people from taking the very first steps to getting the help that they need mm -hmm. if they have a behavioral health care disorder, mental illness, substance use disorder, intellectual developmental disabilities. It's this stigma um, that unfortunately our society puts on us that makes us feel like it's our fault. We're less than, we should be ashamed of, when the fact is mental illness is a medical diagnosis, just like heart disease and cancer and diabetes. We need to understand we should not be ashamed if we or someone we love lives with a mental health diagnosis, uh, right now, we say between one in four and one in five Americans are affected by mental illness every year. And of course, with the COVID-19 pandemic, that has been exacerbated. Yeah. So when we say you're not alone, we're talking about on average 60 to 80 million Americans are affected by mental illness every year. So you really are not alone. And we just wanna eliminate that stigma. And the way we think we do that is by normalizing the conversation. Um, so people don't feel like they're alone. People don't feel ashamed. Uh, what my wife and I always say, if you see someone wearing an everybody versus stigma shirt, you know you're not alone because whoever is wearing that shirt is not by happenstance. Right, right, right. And I, you know, and I want to go over some of the warning signs. So, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we have went over this before, but it's always good to refresh 
um, the information so that those of you who are going through something with a family member or yourselves, we, Kevin and I and many more want you to know you're not alone. So see, some of these are the warning signs. So, Kevin, let's talk about some of these warning signs we have posted up here. So one of the first I want to start with is right in the middle of the page, because most people need to understand 50 percent of all lifetime cases of mental illness onsets by the age of 14, 75 percent by the age of 24. And we know, especially again, through the pandemic, that many of our young people, because of social isolation, because of online bullying, um, because of lots of things that we have taken for granted, a lot of our young people um, have been significantly impacted by mental illness, whether it is depression, anxiety, uh, eating disorders, all of that has come from the social isolation mm -hmm. that we've dealt with through the pandemic. And so we want young people to understand that it's okay not to be okay and that we can get them help. But equally as important, we want the parents to understand, please take your young people seriously. If your child comes to you and say, mom, dad, I'm not feeling quite myself. Mom, dad, I'm having suicidal thoughts. Mom, dad, I'm being bullied. Please get them help. Mm -hmm. Don't just assume that it's going to go away and it's going to brush right. over. Right. Um, right. And then I do in know general... This, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm switched screens on you right quick, but I want to answer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you tell you, you, when you say to the young people, go to your parents and talk to them and this and that, and some of the parents are like, well, just take a nap, honey. Go lay down, you know, do something. Mm -hmm. I, I brought this screen up to say suicide is not the answer, okay? But, well, when people see information like this, Kevin, are they mm -hmm. taking heed to it or are they just, you know, ignoring it? Because, look, you have up here 46% of the people who die by suicide have diagnosed mental health conditions. Most people don't want to face that. They think that somebody just overnight decided to take their lives. Mm-hmm. Well, and the next, the statistic right under that, 90% of the people who died by, who have survived a suicide attempt or died by suicide has had some mental health experience mm -hmm. prior to their death. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not whether they've been um, specifically diagnosed, but through what we call a forensic autopsy, we talk to families, um, their, their doctors after those individuals have shown some symptoms of mental illness mm -hmm. prior to taking their lives. And to your point, Marsha, par part of the reason we're not heeding these warnings is because everybody would like to think it wouldn't happen to me. It wouldn't happen to my loved one. It happens to somebody else. But what we need to understand in the United States we lose two and a half times more people to suicide than we do to homicide every year. Wow. But when we turn on the news, what do we hear about every day? What's the latest homicide? Mm -hmm. But think about the, the impact. We lose about 20,000 Americans to homicide every year, but we lose 50,000 people to suicide. Mm. That's deep. So, yeah, we have to take this seriously, and we can't just assume that somebody's having a bad day, they're crying out for attention. Uh, I always tell uh, law enforcement officers, and I know we're going to talk about this a little later, uh, I do a training with law enforcement officers, and I had one tell me one day, well, you know, it's normally just a cry for help. They just want attention. Then give them attention, right. because right. you never know what's real and what's not. And if all it's going to cost you is time and you can save a life, if you just want my attention, I'll give you my attention. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, you know, I want to share you guys uh, phone number and web information because, you know, as we're talking about it, someone who's watching the show today, you know, feels like they need to make that phone call and speak to someone. Yes. And, you know, when we talk about suicide prevention really quickly, Proactive behavior health care is suicide prevention. Um, one of my hot button issues is people say, if you know someone who's in crisis, call the uh, suicide prevention hotline. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to wait until you're in crisis. If you see me and you already know Kevin's not quite acting himself, help me at the onset. Help me early. Don't wait until you think I'm going to go over the edge. Right, right. You know, it. And it, well, what would, let me ask you this. So, because now um, marijuana is more legal than it ever has been, 
Do mm-hmm. you feel, and I'm just asking you on a personal level, do you feel that this is also affecting some of our young people or people in general uh, way of thinking that may cause them to have some adverse effects like, hey, I can fly. I mean, you know, not to be funny, but I'm just saying sometimes, you know, now you can go to a dispensary and you can pick what you want. Okay. Mm-hmm. And But everybody can't uh, uh, digest or smoke or whatever, you know, medical marijuana, and they have some adverse uh, effects from doing things. So a couple quick things, and thank you for that question. Um, I'm not a psychiatrist. I always have to put my disclaimer out there. I'm an activist and an advocate. I'm not a doctor, but I work with many. And here's what they tell me. When we're talking about especially young people in marijuana, people say, well, marijuana is not going to hurt you. Marijuana kills brain cells. It just does. And we have to remember that the brain doesn't fully uh, develop until we're between 24 and 25 years old. So I am not a supporter of recreational marijuana. The okay. other thing, Marsha, that just came out earlier this week, there was a national study that said marijuana does not provide the benefits. Uh, you know, people say, well, I smoke because it calms me down and all mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. There's a national. Yeah, there's a national study that came out and said marijuana is not as effective as people think. And then the last thing, because we have dispensaries and, you know, we're legalizing recreational marijuana, there are a lot of people who are still buying marijuana on the street. And marijuana, one, has thousands of chemicals that are not identified. And then you have people who are lacing marijuana with fentanyl and other things that will either kill you or can induce some kind of psychosis because you have to understand mental illness is a chemical imbalance in your brain. When you start introducing other foreign chemicals like fentanyl and other things, you are just asking for trouble. So I don't support recreational use of marijuana. I understand. I I truly understand. And like you said, you got your street drugs still in effect along with your dispensaries. And, you know, either way a person goes could be dangerous to their lives. But, you know, somebody says, well, I can do this now. I can walk down the street and smoke. I can, you know, go in a bar and smoke, whatever. But they don't know the repercussions behind what they're doing. Well, I'm going to show my age again, but remember back in the <laughs> 80s when uh, Nancy Reagan said, just say no, mm-hmm. that say that no. is the model that I followed and I preached to my kids. Yeah. Don't risk it. It's not worth the potential harm, whether it's laced with something that can kill you or that one time can mess up your brain chemically and you have to live with that for a lifetime. One time too many. One time too many. Yep. Now, now I know you got a new program, and I shouldn't say new. Well, I don't know. It might be new. So let's introduce this new program to our viewers, the International Crisis Intervention Team. Uh, mm-hmm. I love this logo. That is. Did you create that logo? I did not. Uh, <laughs> it was. I love to take credit, but I, I did not. Well, um, it, and, the, and the logo has meaning, and forgive me because I'm getting old. I can't remember all of it. But if you go on the CIT International website, it will actually tell you why those colors. But CIT is something that most people in the community are unaware of, but it is a tremendous resource that we should take advantage of. Um, Full disclosure, uh, in January, I was elected president of CIT International. Mm -hmm. CIT is Crisis Intervention Team Training. And it is a community program, not just a law enforcement program, but it is a partnership between law enforcement and community where uh, it's a full 40 hour training. And if you hear somebody say they had CIT training and it wasn't a 40 hour training, it's not the real CIT. And I'm just going to say that. Okay. Um, But it is a 40 hour training where law enforcement officers and first responders are taught verbal de-escalation techniques but they are also made aware of behavioral health resources that are available. So instead of taking people to jail or to the emergency room, they take them to where we can truly get the help that we need. It is safer for the officers, it's safer for civilians. And at the end of the day, it improves the quality of life and it saves lives. Marsha, most people don't know, the Department of Justice um, released their 2021 study uh, just within the last couple of months, 
25% of people who are shot and killed by law enforcement are people living with a known mental health disorder, mm -hmm. 25%. And then of them, a large percentage, unfortunately, are us people of color. Wow. So when law, what we have to understand, and I'm going to be fair to my friends in law enforcement, I don't want to throw them under the bus. Law enforcement officers are asked to be the first responders to a lot of things mm -hmm. they're not qualified for. Um, serious mental illness is one of those things. So what we're trying to do is give them supplemental training. Uh, these officers go through a very intense 40 hour training. Uh, half of that time is hands on role plays uh, and they get a lot of clinical information and it, it is literally eye opening for them. So they know how to verbally deescalate and help people instead of hurt them and send them to jail. The other thing that most uh, people don't know is in the state of Michigan, the Wayne County Jail is considered the largest behavioral health care treatment facility. Mm. And that's not unique to Michigan or Detroit, because if you go to Ohio, if you go to Ohio, it's the Cuyahoga County Jail. If you go to Illinois, it's the Cook County Jail. If you go to California, it's the Los Angeles County Jail. When we remember when we closed all the mental health hospitals back oh, in the late yeah. 90s. Uh, well, here's that the, brother Engler was in in uh, brother <laughs> in, yeah. in charge, so, and I didn't mean to stop you, but you know, I, I never understood that in his his decision to, you know, toss people out in the streets like that and try to make the families more responsible. Well, the family yeah. can only do so much because they're not experienced or educated in caring for persons with a mental illness, but they will tend to their loved ones as far as like trying to feed them, clothe them, mm -hmm. and try to keep them safe, but you can't control a person. And yet here it is, you know, that governor at that time thought it was the grand idea to shut down these facilities and, uh, to me, just all hell broke loose after that. I'm, you know, seriously, because you couldn't walk down the street, you didn't, you didn't know what was going to happen. Marsha, it was all about money. It was, it was not about taking care of people. It was all about money. And this, uh, my, my, my friend Malcolm X would call this is chickens coming home to roost. Um, this is cause closing all those state hospitals. The effect is what you just described. All of those, a vast majority of those people ended up homeless on the street. Their families wanted to care for them, but didn't know how to care for them. And I can speak from personal experience with my son. Um, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And when I went through this with my son, I didn't understand his the symptoms of his mental illness and what he was living with. So we knocked heads a lot. And I was like, boy, why don't you understand you have to get up and take a shower every day and you have to clean up behind yourself and you have to brush your teeth and you have to take your medication. So I'm trying to force him to stay at a level that he was at prior to his diagnosis. Mm -hmm. He's trying to get me to understand, dad, I'm not there. It's not that he's being resistant and fighting me. His brain just works differently right. now. Right. And so what ends up happening is you have well-intended family members who want to take care of individuals in need, but they can't. And you end up fighting and either either I as the parent end up putting you out or he as my son and the patient says, I'm tired of fighting with yep. you. So I, yeah, I'm out of here because mm -hmm. I don't want to keep going through this drama. And then you got the part where law enforcement comes in because you call them and you say, I need to get, you know, somebody to come and help me gain control of my house and blah, blah. These guys, you know, ladies and gentlemen, they come ready. I mean, <laughs> law enforcement yeah. come with the mindset, you know, I got to de-escalate this situation. And they don't have a clue that this is your son or daughter or brother or sister and that they're not trying to harm you. But their their mental state has taken full effect. And then they come, with, you know, with, with guns ready or tasers ready and matters go from bad to worse or, you know, resulting to death. You know, Kevin, I wanted to show um, this particular slide right here for the CIT 40-hour uh, curriculum training. Mm -hmm. And I know you just briefly went over it, and I see the website. So let me ask you this. So this training, is it, what, uh, does Michigan have it now? Are we ready? So Michigan has it, but not enough people in Michigan has, has it. So for example, uh, Detroit police um, has taken the lead, um, I would say, as a law enforcement agency 
Uh, right now, there are at least seven of Detroit's police precincts that have CIT trained officers. CIT is not for every officer. You have to have the right mindset and the right heart for this. Um, and there's some, quite frankly, there's some law enforcement officers who still refer to themselves as hook them and book them. You know, they, oh, if yeah. you call me, I'm going to put the cuffs on somebody and I'm taking somebody to jail. So you want somebody who is willing to see the world through a different lens and say, you know what, this person is in crisis. They need help. And, and, and Marsha, if I could go back for just a second, because you said something very important. That, oh, I'm sorry. Go when, ahead. when law enforcement is called, when you call 911, you are calling someone to come to your home who has a badge and a gun. That does not mean they have evil intention, but we know self-preservation is the law of the land. Mm -hmm. So if I feel as a law enforcement officer, if I feel like you are a threat to me, I'm going to defend myself. Mm -hmm. um, three things happen when law enforcement officers do what we call go hands on. And you hear this in the news all the time when they hurt somebody, an officer says, I feared for my life. I was following my training yeah. or this person, this individual failed to follow my commands. And what we're trying to help law enforcement officers understand is if a person is experiencing a mental health emergency, a crisis, it's not that they're refusing to follow your commands. They're not able to follow your command. You, when you show up with that badge and gun, and again, I don't mean to throw my friends in law enforcement under the bus, but police officers tend to escalate more than they mm -hmm. de-escalate because mm -hmm. that's how they gain control of situations. Put your hands up. Show me ID. Uh, do You're this. Right. Do that. Well, to a person who's in a mental health crisis, and, and my son went through this once, to him, that officer is a threat to him. Mm -hmm. He's trying to get away from that threat. Because he has fight or flight just like that officer does. But you know what, Kevin? So, if, if this, I mean, cut you off, but in this in this type of program that you guys, you know, have have in mind, have designed, uh, the public needs to be educated along the way. Now, this last uh, slide here, the CTI support training for nine one one. Okay, so when you guys are done training. There is, is there going to be a um, informative platform or something so that the public will know that there is a specialized task force or unit that is CTI trained? And if you call a number and ask for help that we need to notify the dispatchers that this person is of um, mental illness status and, you know, send out a specialist or just make aware that this person is a men has mental illness status. It's got to no, be something absolutely. because, you know, to me, you could train all day and then I make that phone call and I get the wrong one coming to my house because they're not a part of that team. And I know the team may not have 150 something available police officers. But if I call and say my son is ill, it's a mental illness situation. Can you send someone out? I don't know to say CTI. I just know I need help. So I had this with a family last week. A mother called me and told me her adult daughter was off her medication and having some issues. And I told her, when you call 911, and this brings up a good um, kind of segue to talk about 988, uh, which I'll get into. But right now we have 911. So when you call 911, if, it's a, if it is a mental health issue, please be clear to tell the 911 dispatcher, this is a mental health issue. My son, daughter, spouse, whatever the case may be, is in crisis right now. And I am specifically asking that you dispatch a CIT trained officer to respond to this call. And, and that is really important mm -hmm. because many departments like DPD, um, Detroit Police Department, and many other surrounding agencies have CIT trained officers, and they try to schedule them so there's at least 20% of their officers are trained and are on various shifts. So there's always a CIT trained officer. So specifically ask for that because then, like you said, you don't know who's going to show up mm -hmm. and you don't know how it's going to turn out. Um, well, and, you know, and, Kevin, and that's just, but to be honest, you know, as, as, these, as this training is going to affect 
I'd like to ask you and uh, the chief of police to come back and join us to help educate the public. Because, you know, I know it now. You know it now. But the public is going to be the last to know. And not that the news won't touch on it, but the news just touched on it. We need to have a platform that, you know, uh, a consistent uh, resource that people say, oh, yeah, I can call that and ask for this instead of just jumping right into it. Because people are not going to remember that acronym. Yeah. You know? Well, and, and and added to that, Marsha, you asked a really good question about the public's involvement. CIT is not just a police program. It's not just training. It It is what we call a community program. And so in addition to the officers being trained, along with behavioral health care professionals, there is a community oversight board that meets on a regular basis. So this isn't a one and done. You go get the training, put a certificate on the wall. We give you a pen and you say, okay, I'm done. It is a living, breathing program in every community where once a month you have an oversight committee that meets and says, how many mental health runs did you go on? How were they resolved? Did we get the people the help that they need? And, and in communities, we have found that where CIT has been utilized since 1989. So this is not a new program. It's just new to the community. Well, I, I, um, I tell but, you what, Kevin, you because you know what? You and I can can talk. I'm running out yeah. of time. You got to come back. I know. You got to. And I'm going to ask you Anytime. to come back, ask the chief police, whoever. Let's do this again real soon. Sounds good. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry I had to cut you, but you know what? I'm going to have you back real soon. Real soon. Okay. I, Okay. Anytime. Thank you Hold so much. Hold for me one second, Kevin. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hate to stop because you know what? Every time Kevin Fisher comes, we learn something new about mental illness crisis. So please tune in again. Send us a phone call. Let us know what you think about this program. And if you have questions, we'd like to send it over to Executive Director Kevin Fisher. All right. So don't just you know sit there and say that was good. No. Make a response. Let us know how you feel. And we'll get those questions back over. I'm your host, Marsha Florence, for Just Ask. And what do I always say? If you know a person with a disability or if you just have a general question, don't be afraid to ask. Just ask. I'm your host. See you next time.